Kristen Denny Chambers, and this is the Chambers Chat Room. My guest today is David Carter. We're going to talk a little bit about his roles with the Tulsa Symphony and go over some really neat teaching strategies. Hi, David. Hello. Well, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, your education background, and your musical background. That way we have a little bit of an idea of where you're coming from. Sure. My name is David Carter, and I am the Principal Clarinetist and Education Director for Tulsa Symphony. Um, I, my training, I did my doctorate at the University of Oklahoma, where I studied with David Etheridge. Um, before that, I earned a graduate certificate in orchestral studies uh, in Detroit, where I studied with Ted Oyen. Um, and then, let's see, I did my Master's of Music um, with Jim Pine at Ohio State University. And then my undergraduate degree was a bachelor's of music from the University of North Texas. And I primarily studied clarinet with Jim Gillespie there. Okay, wonderful. So from what you shared with me earlier, um, your actual end goal through all your education and your background was to teach at the college level. And now you're an executive uh, musician with the Tulsa Symphony, doing the education director position as well. Tell us a little bit about that journey and, and how you ended up in that place. Right. So um, I, I, I'll try and keep it keep it brief. But uh, if, it, if it gets confusing, maybe clarify. I, I'm hoping that maybe this is, is useful for, for some sort of young and developing players because sometimes the route we take, um, you never know where you're going to end up. <laughs> and uh, if you keep plugging away, hopefully, you know, stuff, stuff can kind of come together. But um, so my original, original goal, I mean, when I started playing clarinet, I got interested in performing uh, pretty early on, though, of course, I was young and didn't, didn't really know what that meant. But I, I knew that I um, was interested in that. But um, my sort of original, original goal as I was coming into um, uh, later junior high and high school was I wanted to be a jazz player. Um, I had picked up saxophone after I started clarinet and, and had taken a, a pretty strong interest in jazz. And so that's how I ended up at North Texas, um, which is a really prominent jazz program. And so, um, so, I, so I went to North Texas and while I was there, that's, uh, you know, I was kind of juggling both worlds, taking full-time clarinet lessons while also doing the whole jazz degree thing. Um, and, and, uh, and, and it was at that point then that I really got to play in a symphony orchestra uh, for the first time at, at the school, and, and it's it's quite a good orchestra. The clarinet section was very strong, and the conductor was um, uh, Anshel Brusloff, who was a uh, former concertmaster of the Philadelphia Orchestra. And so that was that was really a big influence on me. Um, I can remember doing uh, also Sprock and doing the Saint Saëns Organ Symphony, and we went and played at the Meyerson and Talis. And um, anyway, and so it was at that point that I was like, "Geez, I really kind of I really kind of like this whole orchestral world." And so what I really set off on. <laughs> halfway through my undergraduate degree was uh, to, to become an orchestral clarinetist. Um, and again, blessed to be naive that I didn't really understand what that entailed. <laughs> uh, but if I had, then maybe I wouldn't have tried. So uh, that took me to Ohio State where I studied with, with Jim Pine. Um, and then um, that in turn led me to the Aspen Music Festival. And that kind of the orchestral thing was unfolding from there. Um, but after I finished my time eventually in Detroit, I was playing in local orchestras and I was doing a lot of uh, studio teaching. Uh, my wife, who is also an executive musician with Tulsa Symphony and a clarinetist, um, she was finishing her master's degree and we were kind of at this point where we, we didn't know what our next move was. Um, and so it was like right at that time that Dave Etheridge called my wife's clarinet teacher uh, and said, hey, I have two openings. Um, I need two doctoral students. And... Uh, it, I think I think even was like, and, and it would really help if one of them had a saxophone background, which of course I had that. So we were like, well, I, <laughs> you know, we're not too fatalistic, but that seemed like a pretty big sign. So uh, you know, we we auditioned and uh, and moved to Norman, and, and, then, uh, and then sort of things things took off from there. It wasn't long after that we started subbing both of us here in Tulsa, and sort of fell in love with Tulsa. Um, I really embraced the college track thing at that at that point. I, I thought, all right, well, this is a great way for me to keep playing at a higher and higher level, and uh, and I'm going to really give this a shot. So I, I did when I um, finished my degree. I had been doing some adjunct teaching, and then I, I did some adjunct teaching at OU at the University of Oklahoma, and then I got my first full time job, and I, and I taught for five years at the University of Arkansas Fort Smith. Um, <laughs> 
clarinet and saxophone. So I guess it was a good thing that I had the saxophone background because I had hardly touched the saxophone in years. Um, but uh, so, so I did that for about five years. Um, but the whole time um, we were commuting back and forth three or four or five days a week, two hours to Tulsa to play. And uh, in 2012, the principal job in the symphony opened and I auditioned and won that. So that was commuting even more. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, so we really, it's, it's a really cool city. It's a very artistic city, as you know. And uh, so we just kind of fell in love with the place and um, uh, uh, an administrative job opened in the office and my wife applied and got that. So then we relocated to Tulsa and I commuted the other direction to do my teaching for a year. Then the education director position opened and um, and uh, I applied and got that job, and we've we've relocated here. I, I didn't know what would happen administratively if I would uh, like it. I mean, I felt capable, or I wouldn't have applied for the job. But you know, getting on that college track is such a commitment, and so stepping off of it was a little scary. But it's worked out really, really well. Um, I, I, I I like the challenge a lot, and of course, I get to play all the time, which is 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 what ultimately I, I really love. To do so, um, it's sort of a long story, but I can just remember being so frustrated with how in the world am I going to make a living doing this, and um, and feel very lucky that that some things have fallen into place uh, to make it possible. That's an amazing story, and I know that a lot of us we start with a certain thing in mind, and we end up on a totally different track, and that's okay. Things change, and you have to be flexible. You know. <laughs> You know, I don't have the math to back it up, but I, for a long time, I've always thought it's, it's not, in, the goal isn't actually that important. What's important is that you have one <laughs> and you're going after it and you keep your eyes open. That's very true. Very true. You know? Well, tell us a little bit about the Tulsa Symphony, because I know it's, it's unique because it's, it's very run by the musicians. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So we, we sort of, um, we sort of, uh, is it pride ourselves? I don't know what the right wording is there, but um, on this this idea of a musician-led model. Um, so there are other orchestras who have musicians that work in the office and, and, and play uh, in the symphony. Um, and we sort of, uh, from the beginning, they, they really established that this was going to be a new model. And so we have musicians involved at every level of governance. The musicians serve on a certain percentage of the board. All the committees have musicians serving on them. Um, of course, many of the staff positions are served by musicians. Um, uh, and uh, and so all the decisions come through the musicians. Well, what I think comes from that is there's this sort of, um, as I've become more and more of an administrator, I've uh, learned that there's this um, habitual divide that can exist in a lot of orchestras between sort of we and they. And um, I think that leads to a lot of problems. Um, it, it leads to negotiation problems, but it also leads to a lot of hard feelings. And um, I think this model has a lot of potential for uh, sort of softening that relationship um, and I say soften as opposed to solve because of course there's still a lot of personalities in the room and, and, uh, and, and that's a good thing <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah so the, so the model really relies on musicians uh, making a lot of the important decisions and determining the direction of the organization and it's exciting to be a part of I mean the, we're only 11 years old there was another orchestra here before that folded a few years uh, prior and then uh, some musicians and some local philanthropists got together and said all right let's do this again but let's do it differently and so it's a brand new organization I mean 11 years is is brand new but we've gone through a few two or three year well steady growth but the last few years have had a lot of growth and um, it's cool to be a part of that because um, you're really kind of in on on the scaffolding of how it's all going to work um, as opposed to you know joining a, one of the great orchestras, which I'm sure is wonderful. Um, but where a lot of those things, um, there's a much longer tradition. It's exciting. What do you think um, has contributed to the recent growth in the last couple of years? Um, the support of the community for sure has been a big thing. The, the community, I, I, don't, I, I can't, I, I've only been here for three years, so I can't say if this is the case, but it's, it's very possible that some trust just had to be established you know, and it takes time to do that. So it, it could be a product of that. I think crossing that 10 year anniversary mark makes a difference too. I think people are uh, excited to celebrate that with you. And of course, if people can support that and get behind it, well, then you can make better and better programs, which then generate more excitement. And hopefully you can kind of capitalize that, um, not monetarily, but you can capitalize in that on making, kind of taking it to the next level. So that would be what kind of my off the cuff analysis is, but, uh, 
That's what I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as um, being the education director, um, can you share a project that you've done recently? So we have a little bit of an idea of what you do and maybe some of the challenges and victories that you had along the way with that project. Sure. Um, I mean, the one that we can't stop talking about, it's, it's, it's our largest program across the board. It impacts the, the most people that we impact, period. And that's this co partnership we have with um, Carnegie Hall called Link Up. And um, it sort of has taken over um, <laughs> my life uh, in a good way. But it's, I mean, really, uh, we have several education programs and they're really, I inherited several of them and they're very cool. Um, then this one has grown so fast that it's become really kind of the, 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 the focus of what I have, of where my energy goes. But anyway, um, it's the, they've been doing this program for like 30 years at Carnegie Hall. And uh, what it is, is it's uh, the goal of the program is to kind of immerse kids grades three, four, and five in an exploration of orchestral repertoire. And you actually played with us last year on these concerts. And I mean, we're doing O Fortuna and like, like in real repertoire, and these kids are psyched <laughs> about Orf, you know, they're, they're really into it. Uh, so anyway, it kind of immerses them in learning to play these pieces and sing these pieces, and they do these creative activities where they're composing their own original pieces, and, and on and on and on. So um, we started that program two years ago as sort of a pilot to see what would happen to get our feet wet and see if we wanted to do it. We started that in two school districts, um, some schools from two school districts with 1,200 students and hoped that we could maybe expand that to 5,000 last year when you were there. Um, we ended up at 12,000 students last year in five, every elementary school in five districts, plus a private school. So the thing just blew up. This year, we have um, nine, every elementary school from nine complete districts, two private schools, and two homeschool students. Uh, and we will serve 17,500 students and teachers through the program. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's insane. Yeah, so for, for a community this size, that's just unheard of. In fact, we, we learned recently that Tulsa, there are 100 orchestras worldwide that participate in this program, and Tulsa is the seventh largest program in the world, which considering the size of Tulsa is pretty, uh, is really, is really pretty cool. And it's, I, I, it's because it's a, <laughs> I think I've lost track of your original question, but mm -hmm. I, the reason I think that it's success, been successful is because it's actual, an actual partnership. I mean we don't produce this program, we sort of make it happen locally. But of course, Carnegie Hall is Carnegie Hall. Um, and then the school districts themselves, the teachers are, are saying, we want this program, how can we help? And they're stepping in to say, let's make this happen. And funders in the community are saying, wow, this is totally cool. They come to the concerts and they're blown away by all these kids celebrating, you know, singing along with Tchaikovsky and stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, and so then they get excited and they want to support it. So it, it's really truly like a community service partnership program. And, and it's been a, it's been a big success for us here locally. And it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of fun. I bet it's a lot of work, but man, being seventh largest program, that's something huge and something very, very good to be proud of. So that's, that's really awesome. Congratulations. Oh, well, it's a team effort, but yeah, we're pretty happy about that. <laughs> Great. So um, changing gears just a little bit, tell us a little bit about what has been the most meaningful or most profound performance you've had as principal clarinet with the Tulsa Symphony. So uh, let's see, I got the actual principal job in 2012. And there were sort of, sort of some landmark opportunities that led up to that that really stuck in my in my head as important. But if I look back on my time here so far, which I guess is going on 10 years now from the time I started subbing with the group. Um, last season, I got to play the Mozart Concerto, um, both on our main stage classic series, and then also again at the OK Mozart Festival in the summer. And um, I mean, of course, playing a concerto uh, is uh, not something I, I, in my role, get to do every year. It only comes up every few years. Uh, and that was the first time I got to solo with um, the, the orchestra that is that's my job. And so that was cool. Um, of course, pretty good music <laughs> as well that helps uh, but also like it's Mozart right there's a lot of pressure on that so um, I think what adds to that experience um, it would be special regardless but what adds to that experience is that we don't have a, um, a music director so we have a principal guest conductor and a series of other guest conductors um, so all the programming goes through our artistic committee 
which means which is composed of some board members and mostly musicians. And so um, to to be trusted by my colleagues with that uh, is, is makes it an even more meaningful experience. Um, so that was that was that was definitely a highlight so far. That's awesome. All right, well, let's switch gears a little bit again. We're going to go through some teaching questions. I'd love to hear some of your strategies on teaching and working with students. Um, so what are some ways that you help your students hone in on their concept of sound? Right. So um, sound, I think, as we talk about it, <laughs> can get to be a really hairy word. <laughs> um, I think, you know, for a lot of the reasons that some people will cite, it's a very personal thing. Um, but I think also we get so obsessed about particular styles of sound that we can really end up quite distracted um, and, and it can even end up in com counterproductive conversations about sound um, and, and about optimal development. So especially with my students, and, and I should probably clarify that um, at this point I keep a rather small studio, three to five students maximum. Um, uh, they're, they're mostly high school students, though I have some college students that come to see me um, from time to time. Um, but mostly they're high school students and pretty serious high school students. So, um, so uh, that being the background, with them, I, I really try to focus more on function because I think when we get obsessed about sound, we lose track of the fact that you need your sound, whatever it is, to work, <laughs> to overstate it, but it needs to do its job. So um, asking questions uh, of yourself like, um, does the sound respond when I need it to or when I want it to? And I mean that very specifically to not say, does it respond instantaneously? Does it respond when you need it to in the way you need it to? Um, are you able to play in tune and blend with your colleagues? Are you able to project in your setting where you need to project? And that can be that can change a lot. Um, are you able to sustain or, or learn to sustain phrases that you need to sustain? Um, if you can do all of those things relatively comfortably, um, then you've probably stumbled your way into whatever is your sound. Um, I, I think when we start to get really obsessed about things like, oh, they have a bright sound or, oh, they have a dark sound or um, even when we talk about highs and lows in the sound, um, uh, oh, spread and focused, right? Um, there's, of course, there's the problem of, are we even talking about the same thing? Because we're describing something in abstract terms, so who knows? Um, right. But there's, there's, there's also, the, the, at some point you have to go, none of that is important <laughs> because you could have, first of all, it's probably imperceptible to the vast majority of the people that are listening to you, maybe other than other clarinet players, right. the degree to which you're listening. Um, however, even within your colleagues right around you in the orchestra, I can tell you that, that the person sitting to my left is going to be a whole heck of a lot bothered, more bothered by my response always being late or always being early then they're going to be about the quality of my sound if it's on the brighter end of the spectrum or the, on the darker end of the spectrum. So um, all that is to say, I, I try and focus more on the function of the sound. Um, I think it's more concrete for students to be able to understand. Uh, and, then, um, and, then, and, then, and then we kind of see where the sound goes from there because ultimately you're looking for flexibility in your sound as well. Um, you know, a perfect example of is like, you never ever let the sound spread ever. Well, what about the opening of Rhapsody in Blue? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so so I, I, do, I do think that all of those, when we talk about the color spectrum, are all probably useful colors, as long as they function and do their other jobs as well. So, it's not that I don't have a preference of sound. I do. I have players who sound. I'm just, you know, oh. But the average listener, that's probably not what draws them into those players. It's Hopefully, it's their musicality and phrasing and how they use their sound. That's much, much more important. Okay. I really like that idea of function because so many of my students, they struggle with at least at least one aspect of the function of their sound. And you yeah. got to focus on that before you're trying to tell them or, or, or they're trying to, to say, I want a warmer sound or I want a brighter sound. It's, yeah, let's, let's work on function. <laughs> I, I, I think of the story of Angie, my, my wife, and, and she went to a lesson with, a, with this, this one teacher of hers and she, she tells the story and you're interviewing her now too, uh, <laughs> apparently. 
uh, through, through me. Um, but she tells this great story where she went into this, uh, she went into this, this lesson and she was kind of in her head, you know, and you can kind of get wrapped up in your head and she played this passage and she got done and it was, it was something like, oh man, I, I, I didn't pace that the way that I wanted to. And I needed to do this and I needed to do that. And the teacher just looked at her and said, I was just going to suggest that you could play the dynamics, <laughs> you know? So I think that illustrates the point, uh, that, <laughs> I, I hate to say like do your job first and then worry about the art because the art is your job. Um, but I think you can get so in your head about about um, just sound above all else that uh, you can forget to function as as a musician. Yeah, that's true. Okay, um, thinking about fundamental skills, mm -hmm. what fundamental skill do you feel that you come across the most with students that you have to correct and what are some ways that you correct that skill? Uh, so, I mean, you're, of course, you're hitting all your fundamentals always and forever, <laughs> forever and ever. Um, but I almost feel like it's a cliche, but embouchure is always a thing. I, if, I, if I'm being totally honest, it doesn't sound like a very inspired response, but I fix more embouchures, including my own, <laughs> than anything else. Um, you know, for a long time, I sort of thought it was related to this um, less than optimal early teaching um, thing, you know, uh, so-and-so study with their band director who was a drummer, and what does a drummer know about teaching embouchure? But I, as I've gotten a little further along, I don't, I don't think that's the case nearly as black and white as I thought in kind of my younger teaching. Um, I think, um, well, we can go into this a little bit. I won't go too deep. You tell me if you want to go deeper. Um, but I think setup plays a big issue there. I think um, we, we, we get some pretty resistant setups on some pretty young students and they end up biting, which is, I think, pretty recognized by Clarence. But um, I think more important to that is um, we, we forget that, that, that the embouchure is, is a lot of musculature development and it's only going to develop gradually over time. And so I think one of the main things we have to have when we're helping students with their, uh, any aspect of their playing, but the embouchure comes up a lot, is uh, patience. Um, so, uh, the, kind of the analogy I was, I was thinking of is, is like a runner, right? Like world-class runner <laughs> runs in slow motion and does form drills before they go out and run, you know, some ridiculous marathon time. <laughs> they still work on their form. So, uh, we should, we should be constantly, we should really just be establishing our students the awareness to continually refine their embouchure because it's a living, breathing, changing thing. So they should always be checking in on it. Um, I think I use fairly typical stuff for embouchure development, um, you know, long tones in a mirror. Um, I really like to use um, Bob Spring's chromatic scale exercise, which is just chromatic scale and whole notes um, strung together in four notes. Uh, quarter note equals 60. Um, I, I, I tend to, I use that myself from time to time still, but I, I tend to use it with students who are just coming to me for the first time as a way to establish a certain amount of stability in the context of a simply designed exercise. They're not distracted by a lot of things. And then uh, most of my students uh, will move into working on David Weber's uh, flexibility exercises. Um, we spend quite a bit of time on the chromatic one and then um, if my students get far enough along then we'll go into the arpeggios as well. Um, so that uh, you know, it can't just be solid, it's not steel. You do have to have flexibility. Um, the other big piece of that for me is I do a, myself and I have my students do a lot of double lip playing. Um, when I studied with Mr. Pine, I played double lip exclusively for three years. And then I came off of double lip when I was studying with Mr. Oyen again. And a few years ago, I started sprinkling it back in as part of my practice routine. And now I go fluidly back and forth. It was a, a I've been doing that for a while, but it struck me last season we did Beethoven 4, and it was one of those lyrical solos in the slow movement, and I went to play it, and it wasn't until two or three or four measures into the lyrical solo, which it's a pretty, it's a very exposed and a little bit of a scary solo, you know, you can have some some grunting and, and response problems and things. Anyway, it wasn't, it was two or three or, I don't remember how many measures in before I had this awareness like, oh, I just grabbed this double lip and had no intention of doing it that way. Um, and that was a big moment for me of like, this is just totally another tool in my toolbox. 
Um, so anyway, I use double lip plane with my students a lot too. I, I gradually work them in most cases towards being able to do all of their long tones and all their scale work on double lip embouchure. Now, they can't usually do that right out of the gate. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> but, um, I do think, uh, I, I wish I understood why, <laughs> like I could make it, make, make it up, but I don't actually scientifically have a full understanding of why it does this, but it seems to develop strength in the right places. <laughs> And that is just not solid pedagogy, but it seems to work, so I, so I do it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I use it when I'm warming up and occasionally in certain passages, and I would like to use it more, um, but I think my muscles need to develop more for that to happen. But I do right. like it, and I use it with students, um, especially those who, you know, everything else seems to be functioning, but you can tell maybe they're biting a little bit, and it kind of helps open up their sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's funny when I felt I felt like when I was switched to double lip, uh, I was a master student at the time, and it felt like so controversial. And then of course everybody would say, yeah, but Elsevier Dare plays double lip, and and so does uh, you know Harold Wright played double lip, and those were like the go-to. Like don't forget, <laughs> these guys play double lip. Um, but man, more and more people started coming out of the word work going, yeah, I, I play double lip too, <laughs> you know. Okay. So uh, now it's I think a lot of people are using it. I think that's that's really a good thing. Yeah, I have a couple. I'll do real short here, but there's a couple of things that um, I use that might be helpful to people. Um, so, like you know, chin shape is often one of those things that we see and that we're like, ah, oh, problems, problems, you know, danger. Um, and so, uh, so we see this like, uh, you know, can you see that profile? I don't know that yeah. thing. And I would first I would caution that that doesn't necessarily mean biting. <laughs> which is the go-to, right? Oh, they're biting because they're squishing in. It can also mean that they actually don't have enough development and firmness in their embouchure to hold it in the right position. So Dr. Etheridge um, used to have uh, have his students play a low D and then buzz that note. Oh, I don't have perfect pitch, but it's somewhere in the range. And if you have a student buzz that note, I mean, like he would have us play it and then pull the clarinet out of our face and we you know, uh, see what note we were on. But if man, I would go higher than nine times out of 10. If they can do that, then their embouchure is immediately in the position. And it may take them a week or two to develop the musculature to do it, but then you can draw their attention to it in the mirror, um, visually and tactically with their hands and just with their face itself, and they can carry that into their plane. So I, I use that quite a bit, um, and, um, and that's been successful. The other thing that keeps coming up for me is, I don't know how the stars are aligning, but I keep attracting anchor tongers to my studio. <laughs> And some of them are like really, really good players, really good players. Um, and uh, for some reason, I have had some success in, um, in, in steering them off of the anchor tonguing path. And I find that weird <laughs> because of all the many issues in my plane, that is one of the traps that I didn't fall for. I was never an anchor tonguer. Mm -hmm. But um, just in dealing with, with the issue with a few students, I, I've been able to help correct them by doing the, you know, the typical light tonguing, vibrating the reed under the tip of your tongue. Tick, tickling your tongue with the tip of the reed because that draws attention immediately to where on the tongue you are and where on the reed you are. And then gradually working in, into being able to do it over the course of the, or over the full range of the instrument. So um, so what is that? Embouchure, embouchure slash chin shape and anchor tonguing are the things that I, for whatever reason, um, am blessed to fix. <laughs> Well, I, I do love the the David Etheridge concept of the buzz, and he actually has a video on YouTube that I've watched and watched with my students, so yeah. that's out there. I didn't know if you knew that. <laughs> I, I think I did. Did he do it for Rico or something a while ago? I forgot. I forgot. It was, there. It was also in his books. He has a series of books for beginner right. and intermediate players, and um, yeah, it's uh, it works well. I, I, it's such a strange thing. <laughs> Well, do you feel like you have a teaching specialty, something that you get really excited about when you get to teach the concept? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if it's a specialty as in I'm effective at it, but I really, um, I really enjoy teaching, um, uh, maybe it's just one aspect, but of phrasing. Uh, I, I uh, a, a while ago I was, uh, <laughs> was it, it may have been Dr. Etheridge, I can't remember now. But uh, I was playing a lesson, and, and, and I remember the response I got was sort of like, eh, <laughs> that was fine. <laughs> you know, and the, the message was sort of like, yeah, that was all fine and good, but it was really boring. And, and so I thought, well, I'm tired of, of, of feeling like um, an executor. 
Uh, and so and so I started digging into seeing what literature was out there about learning to play musical. I was also tired of hearing about, um, oh, you, you can't teach this, it's, it's born in, you can't teach any <laughs> <laughs> which is so discouraging like what's yeah. the point no wonder uh you know people are worried about our field shrinking uh anyway so uh i i found this book in, in the library at ou that was called the art of musicianship by phil farkas who was a horn player and uh and uh he talked about phrasing um as breathing and and, and not not just breathing in the sense that we play but as in if you take a slow breath in there's this point at the top of the breath where everything's expanded and there's just a slight suspension and then everything gradually relaxes from there. So I've, I've sort of developed some tricks I, I use with students to help them experience the phrasing um, from, from breathing in and out while they try to hear the phrase in their head and identifying where the crux is from identifying the sort of ebbs and flows within that crux and then actually having them play and breathing in and out with them as as they play the phrasing and, and I really love that stuff that usually leads to a pretty big aha moment for them or at least for me I, I don't know <laughs> they smile so that's good <laughs> how about some ways you have helped your students expand both extremes of their dynamic ranges mm -hmm. uh, I have found man I've been going back to these for a, a while now I, I found those David Weber um, flexibility exercises really really useful for this um, I first learned them from um, a mutual friend, from um, Julian Kirk, who had learned them from John Manassi. And she taught them to me at ICA one year, like we found a warm-up room and she showed them to me. And so I started doing them. And then I was uh, in the display room at one of the clarinet fests and noticed that David Gould had printed it in one of the Van Dorn books. There's a Van Dorn exercise book. And so I bought the book. And, um, and uh, anyway, so I, I use that still in my own plane. Uh, if, when you come to rehearsal, you probably have heard me doing the warm-up um, so uh, it's I, I use it a lot um, so um, <clears throat> each of the phrases is laid out so that you start very very soft and get very very loud and come back down um, now I of course I've never had a lesson with David Weber but um, I've kind of taken that on my own to now work students to playing even softer and even louder um, to kind of get the horn out of their face and let their IQ jump up for a second. I uh, I will ha I'll, I'll have them play a passage, and I'll say, okay, so here's where you were you were you were your loudest, and uh, tell me about that on a scale of one to ten. Um, you know, one being no sound at all, and ten being blowing your guts out. Where were you? And um, and it, I mean, it's just an example, but often it will be like, oh, that was like maybe a seven, and I'll have to bring it to their attention that really what's coming out here is that was like a mezzo piano. So this week, I want you to play slightly too loud at the peaks of the dynamics. Um, so um, there's sort of this, this never play louder than beautiful approach. And man, I love the way that that sounds pedagogically, but it hasn't been fruitful for me. Now, maybe I'm getting the point across wrong. Um, I'm finding it much more useful to say things like play slightly louder than beautiful so you can figure out where that line is. Now, I know uh, pedagogically that really what is going to happen is they're going to develop more strength and control at that loud end and it's they're going to be able to play beautiful at louder and louder and louder dynamics um, and then the same thing is true on the other side you know the clarinet is so lucky to be able to play so quiet over the vast majority of the range and so really showing them I mean gosh for most students if you've got this working right you can do a niente entrance or a niente um, uh, exit and they can do it <laughs> because the clarinet is, is just so good at that. So um, in that case, you're mostly just drawing it to their attention. So, Okay. Um, how do you practice challenging musical lines? And then how do you help your students do similar work? Yeah. So, I mean, I mean of course, it depends on what we mean by challenging. Just, you know, Beethoven's four is just challenging, right? <laughs> but we probably mean like a technical passage or something like that. Is that Sort of. Right, like something really tricky with the fingers. Yeah, yeah. So technical passages. Um, I mean, it's, again, not reinventing anything here, but slow, 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 and much slower than I thought. <laughs> um, to the point of even doing, um, doing some work that is in slow motion. I can get quite a bit out of that. So I will do some of that. Um, my go-to starting place on a passage that is uh, that's that's that type of difficult is start at half tempo of where I need to be, and then go up from there. And if it's not a terribly tricky passage, but it's one that I have to work up, 
it'll be a, usually a pattern of start at half tempo, play it two times, touch the metronome up, twice, up, twice, up, twice, up. Oh, I got to 72. Mark that down. The next day, start at 62 and try and get a little bit further, a little bit further. Panic because I didn't save myself enough time to go all the way to the real tempo, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but for the really tri tricky spots, um, I use the five and one method a lot. Um, I don't know if that familiar. I, I think that's pretty familiar. It's in Peter Hadcock's book and a million people use it. Um, sometimes I'll use three and one depending on, on the difficulty of the passage. And then um, in the last few years, I've gone back to using um, different rhythms. I have, I have sets of rhythms that, I, that I'll, like a series of 16th notes, I'll, I'll regroup them. Um, so that the emphasis the, is uh, moving where a long note is around. Um, it's funny, I learned that a long, long time ago, and, and most of us have, but for some reason it didn't resonate with me. I, I used it meticulously and it just didn't produce the results I wanted. And then um, I was using the Play With a Pro videos and, uh, and I noticed Lee Morgan talked about it. And he sounds good. So <laughs> I was like, well, why don't I try it again? And about, it must have been like two or three years ago, I guess. Um, it sort of stuck in this time. I, I, I found it very useful for evening out un, uneven passages. Also for um, using, you know, sometimes in, um, <clears throat> in the orchestra, you'll have these rather free cadenza-like solos that are kind of flourishes and you need a certain kind of flexibility. And so I think having played those with long notes inserted at different places develops a certain amount of flexibility. So I, I found that using rhythms is quite, quite useful. Now I'm talking about my own playing, but I do the exact same stuff with my students. The only thing that changes is the context. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. And I know a lot of students, you know, they, they are like, Oh, practice rhythms. I'll practice long, short and short, long. And you have to say, wait, there's a lot more options than just those two. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. So one of my students had, had had a lesson with somebody that charted all of them out for him on one particular grouping. I think I don't have a copy of it, but there are a lot of rhythms that you can use. Yeah. <laughs> on articulations, you can always mix up articulations as well. All right, now here's a big one for you. So performance anxiety is a huge topic among every lots of musicians. So um, how have you addressed that if you've dealt with it yourself and how do you help your students with performance anxiety? Okay, all right. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I'll start super broad and then I'll get a little more like, um, try this. Um, so super broad, um, <laughs> you're not that important. <laughs> you, you're just not, <laughs> not you personally. Um, when, you, when you're going to perform, it's, uh, there's a, a story I, I often am in the habit of telling people is uh, I was, uh, you know, I was, a, I studied in North Texas and it was a, it's a pretty big, intense jazz school. Um, which can make for some sort of high-strung people at times. Um, but uh, we had this whole, this lecture series uh, where, where these great jazz musicians, really, you know, big name people would come in and they talk to all the jazz majors, majors at once. This was a class, it was very cool. And this, this, this uh, pianist came in who uh, just, just a beautiful mind, right? Like this guy is, is very inspiring. And he came to this room full of really high, highly intense jazz majors at a, at a, at a major jazz school. And, and he, he just kind of looked at everybody and he said, it's only music, <laughs> you know? And everybody was like, oh, what? <laughs> so it just reframed everything as, as like, um, relax, right? So that's sort of the broad picture um, story that, that hopefully people can refer, my students can refer back to, um, to just to put things in perspective at times. Now I know that that is um, maybe uh, a little idealistic. So uh, I think what's really important is that we stop trying to stop feeling nervous because that is unrealistic. And in fact, ultimately, you're going to find you want to be a little bit nervous. <laughs> you want to learn how to use your nerves. So I think you, uh, I, th I think we, we, we want to accept the fact that the nerves are going to be there. And then we want to try and create situations that imitate in the practice room, the physical manifestations of those nerves. So that when the nerves show up at the performance, you can say, hey, How's it going? <laughs> I knew you'd be here. <laughs> and then you can get on with the job of playing. Um, so um, things that you've probably heard about before, like uh, 
you're practicing a passage, you're getting close to uh, uh, audition time or you're getting close to performance time. So then, you know, you, sp you sprinkle in some physical exercise in the middle of your practice session to get your heart rate up. And now play Mendelssohn at the right tempo. <laughs> you know, run around the building and run up the stairs. Um, I, I, I do think there is some merit to doing that. It's not the exact same feeling, but it does get you used to playing when you're out of sorts. Um, I also, what's been very useful for me and I've used with my students is I'm creating games in the practice room that put pressure on you to perform. Now, I think this has to happen at the right time and with the right student, because I have done this and had students who are more of the, I get crushed by these games. Oh, no. <laughs> Fear is never good. Um, uh, so, so, so I think you have to watch how you use it. But um, one of my favorites is, um, you know, often in a lot of the solo work that we're having these students do, the technique, there'll be just a massive tech, technical passages at the end, <laughs> right? Everything, is, oh, there's lyrical and here's all the stuff that's actually hard. So, uh, what I'll have them do is even something as contrived as play the last line with no mistakes, play the last two lines with no mistakes, play the last, oh, you made a mistake, play the last line with no mistakes, play the last two lines with no mistakes, play the last three, until you know you go back to whatever section is reasonable for that student. Um, that can be a real drag <laughs> in your practice room. I, I can remember at school doing similar things with scales um, uh, or, or, or solos that I was working on. It can be a real drag, but what you can also do, because you want it, you're done. You've been practicing and you want it, you want to go to bed. <laughs> and uh, you end up in this place where you're like, all right, I need to focus. I'm distracted by how tired I am and I need to focus and I need to get the job done. Um, and, and you want to be able to call on that type of focus when you're in performance because there are times where you're going to be perf um, distracted. The other thing that does is you end up knowing the end of the piece better than the beginning. So that when you're in performance and you're tired, some of that technique still falls out your fingers, even when you're distracted. So um, I've even used that with memorization of concertos, play the coda, play the B theme in the coda, play the A theme and the B theme in the coda, play the development in the A theme and the B theme in the coda, and that sort of thing. And I've even done it where I've started at the end of the Mozart and back through all three movements all the way through to the beginning of the, the And then of course I still have memory slips in performance, but it does put you in a position to, um, to focus when you're under pressure. So uh, I think, yeah, I think we stop trying to stop the nerves and start trying to work with the nerves. By the way, if you're gonna use that exercise, um, it's fast stuff, maybe 70% of the actual performance tempo is highly advisable. Uh, otherwise some sloppy playing starts to kind of kind of creep in, you know. Oh, I really like that idea um, because acknowledging the nerves is a lot easier than trying to shut them down. And you won't. You'll fail. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, I should say, too, like when you're dividing the music up, it's way better if you can divide it by like phrases or by, by formal sections than by line. But sometimes in a lesson with a student, it's much easier to not have to go into formal analysis of their piece <laughs> and just do it by lines. But anyway, um, anytime you can divide things along musical lines, it's, it's a little better. But, but I think you're right. I, we're, we're not we're not going to get over being nervous. I've even heard very prominent players say, um, I've been in performances where I wasn't nervous and they weren't very good, <laughs> you know? So anyway, that's, that's, I've had, that's worked for me pretty well. I still get nervous all the time. I even have a lot of performances where I'm making mistakes that I'm shocked that I'm making because of nerves, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> luckily it's just music. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for those um, wonderful teaching strategies and, and concepts. So we're going to kind of wrap things up now. Um, sure. I want to go back to the to square one, very, very, very beginning. So tell us the story about how you came to play the clarinet. Uh, my grandpa loved Benny Goodman and Woody Herman. And we would drive around in his car in Omaha, Nebraska, and listen to tapes of, of of those two and their big bands. And, um, and then but it was fifth grade and it was time to join the band if you wanted to join the band. And I wanted to play drums, but I didn't have two years of piano, so they wouldn't let me. <laughs> and I thought my grandpa was a pretty cool guy. <laughs> and so I chose clarinet. Um, you know, I guess at times I felt guilty that I don't have this like, um, oh, it just sounded like the human voice. And 
just spoke to me, but I don't. <laughs> I don't have one of those stories. Uh, it was, it was, uh, it was totally a, a, a. Hey, I know what instrument that is, <laughs> and so I picked that one. And then, of course, the other stuff, the voice, the, the vocal quality, and uh, it feeling like my voice that came actually quite, quite later, uh, being really inspired by other clarinet players, uh, came, came, came a lot later for me. But that's 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 how I picked uh, clarinet. Okay. And the last question I have for you, um, you know, with the Tulsa Symphony, as the education director, you obviously are doing a lot of work out in the community, you know, building future audiences, building the community of musicians. Um, outside of that work, can you think of anything else that we as clarinetists or we as musicians can do to help our industry grow and thrive and, and, and just, you know, make sure that we're going to last? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, well, I mean, the simple answer is that we have to continue to evolve. Um, uh, I, 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 I think we get stuck in, um, in doing things the same way. I mean, what, there's a famous quote about that, but, uh, we get stuck in doing the same things the same way and expecting a different result. And, um, I don't think it's overstated to say that if, all we do is the same thing over and over again, then people are right when they accuse us of being museums. Mm. And I really like museums, but that doesn't mean that it's gonna resonate with everybody else. So um, I think we have to be open about exploring new things um, and trying things new way. Um, I think we have to think long and hard about what the concert experience means, what it looks like for people. Um, I think we get intimidated that they, I mean, you can go online right now and hear the Berlin Philharmonic play pretty much whatever piece you want to hear, right? And that's scary to people, but that's not what's great about going to a concert. That's, it's a totally different experience. I sit and listen to YouTube videos and to the Berlin Philharmonic, but that's a totally different experience than going and hearing the music live. And so as institutions, we have to think about how we're, um, it makes it sound so um, sort of capitalistic or something, but I don't mean it in that way. We have to think about how we package those performances. Um, I think it relates sort of to that obsession with our sound in a way. It's like a, that's a microcosm version of it where we have to step back and be like, you know what? People are not there to hear you. <laughs> they're probably there to hear the composition and the composer. And they're also there to sit among their friends and be a part of this whole experience. So things like what happens before the concert when they show up, you know, I think the, it, this has been going on for a long time, but I think the pre-concert talks that we do and that all, a lot of orchestras do, um, that's really important. Um, I think for some of the same reasons that people want to enjoy a glass of wine, but they want to understand the glass of wine. And uh, I think we have to continue to work on breaking down the sort of, um, the sort of, what is it, elitism, that makes it only accessible to a few. Um, for me, another big part of that is, um, is new music and experimental music. I think we get afraid of putting that music in front of audiences. And, and now that I've worked on the administrative side, I've seen it over and over again where that can turn into condescending to the audience, as though the audience can't handle it, <laughs> which is ridiculous. <laughs> because um, the audience is there to have a mind-blowing experience. And that mind-blowing experience might be unbelievably beautiful Brahms, and it might also be what they thought were just squeaks and squawks until tonight. Mm. It might be multimedia, it might be all sorts of those things, but we, I, I've done a lot of new music, and uh, even if somebody comes up and they're like, what in the world was that? Well, all of a sudden they're having a conversation about this artistic thing <laughs> that if I had played the Brahms Sonata again, they would have been like, oh, that's, that's so beautiful. <laughs> and that would have been it, <laughs> you know? Um, nothing against our, the, our war horse pieces. I love that literature, but I think we need to go ahead and put that stuff right alongside our new possible masterworks uh, and have a dialogue about it. Um, so <laughs> I think we need to look at, 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 at what, what is, uh, what's the draw? Why should people come? Oh, because uh, Mahler, man. Well, you're going to have to explain it better than that <laughs> because most people, that doesn't mean anything to them. Right. So you're going to have to explain it and you're going to have to find a reason for them to want to listen to your explanation and then sit through Mahler. 
which it's is a lot awesome. more enjoyable if they have something they can hold on to and and grasp and I think so. having that helps a lot yeah you know not to not to totally bring it back around but this the, this this link up program where the kids are playing <laughs> their instruments along with us that kind of brought out this realization in the organization that like i love classical music i'm hugely biased <laughs> uh and if you put your you know foot to my throat and i had to admit it i probably love it more because of the feeling i get when i'm sitting on the stage with my colleagues and making the music mm -hmm. and then when i'm sitting in the audience listening i'm taking that experience with me so we have to find ways where people in the audience whether they're actually have a background playing the music or not they feel uh, uh like they're part of the creation of the artwork and they are what they bring to the table interpretively is way beyond valid Excellent. Well, um, I think that's just about it for our talk today. Okay. Well, thank you for your interest so much. This was a real pleasure and, and I'm, I'm flattered that you asked. So. Okay. Thank you, David Carter, for joining us today on the Chambers chat room. Have a wonderful night.